Thanks to Bitmanic for sponsoring, as always, our, our, our number one sponsor back there. Got the guy shaking his head. Um, <laughs> uh, we'd also like to thank the, the factory for providing the space. Uh, Andrew, Andrew's going to give sure. a short spiel here. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the space. If it's your first time, welcome. If it, you're coming back, welcome back. Um, basically, the factory is a, a place to kind of, it's, it's, as I put it, it's cheers for work. Um, so basically, it's, it's a place that kind of promotes productivity and, and just a nice way to get out of the house and, and work with uh, some fellow professionals and things. So if you have any questions about it, let me know. If you'd like to work here and, and kind of get an idea of what we're all about, you can ask me any questions. If you need anything, let me know. But uh, we're just happy you're here and, and hope you enjoy the panel. That's all right. Well, I'm, I'm sure the discussion of uh, co-working will come up in our, in our panel. So. Oh, there you go. Um, uh, I would like to thank Atomic Object. Um, for, for being a longtime sponsor um, and uh, Software GR um, for also being a sponsor and uh, Mutually Human um, has hosted us in the past. Also, i um, like to thank all of you for donating for pizza. Uh, it's a new thing we're, we're trying to start. We don't, we would like to be, to be somewhat self-sufficient. We don't always want to want to be asking for sponsors for money. Um, you know, you guys, at least I, I get a lot out of coming here. And it's certainly worth, you know, chipping in three bucks for pizza that I would, that's what I would pay for pizza anyway. So, um, certainly appreciate that, uh, all of you who did donate. Um, we do have a donate button on the GR Web Dev uh, website. Um, so, uh, if you would like to go there and donate to PayPal, uh, there's, a, there's an easy way to, there's a quick button that you can subscribe, pay five bucks a month. Um, then you'll be a, a, a premium GR Web Dev sponsor and you'll get a gold star or something. <laughs> we'll, we'll figure something out there. We'll, we'll give you a, a badge that you can put on your blog that says that you're a, a, a gold sponsor. Um, um, so we'd like to talk. So next month, uh, our, our topic is going to be Node.js, uh, which is the new hotness. And I'm sure everyone um, is interested in that. Uh, the, uh, so if you're interested in speaking on that, talk to uh, Dave Bronsma um, or tweet at GR Web Dev or make a post on the Meetup site, uh, any of those numbers of ways. Uh, or talk to me or, or Ben or whoever. Talk to someone else about it and they'll talk to us. Or just, just get the information to us. Um, uh, so uh, on, that, uh, on that note, um, there is, uh, on the Meetup site, I'm sure everyone's a member of the Meetup site, if you're not, go there and, and sign up. Um, there is a suggested Meetups tab, like right in the middle of the screen. Um, go on there and look at the Meetups, and you vote for which ones you want by saying you're going to attend. That's how, that's how we decide um, which events we have, is which ones get the most uh, votes. So, um, and then we, we have a little bit of editorial on that. Um, but it really is up to who, say, who says they're going to go. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, a couple other little things I'd like to talk about. Software GR is having a meeting tomorrow that will probably interest most people here. Uh, Andy Keller is going to be talking about um, build versus buy, but in the terms of, or not, not buy, but in terms of system components. like. They built their own web server. They decided that Apache wasn't good enough. So um, things like JavaScript libraries, um, things like that, uh, Rails. You know, 37 Signals invented Rails instead of uh, I'm trying to summarize everything that Andy told me. I'm loving it so bad, so bad. He had, he had a good thing about about 37 Signals there. So. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to that. Andy's always a great presenter. Andy has presented for, for us several times. So okay, um, uh, so check out Software GR. Check out um, another thing coming up is the .NET group has something, and I'm not going to flub this because Jay is going to talk about it. Hey everybody, I'm Jay. Um, I'm one of the organizers for the .NET user group, and I just wanted to mention that um, since everybody here is interested in web. Development typically, um, we have an interesting topic next month, March 28th. You can find out more on our website 
wm.net.org. And, uh, but the, the topic is Windows 8 development using JavaScript and HTML5, so something that would be right up your alley. Some of you have probably been reading some of the, the new cool stuff about WinRT, so it should be an interesting topic. All right, so uh, it's the .NET user group. Uh, that You can find out all about that on the Conga uh, calendar, uh, which links from the jrwebdev.org, uh, links to the WordPress group, which, uh, there's a lot of votes for, for WordPress, but there's already a WordPress group, so we think we're, we're gonna let them handle that. Um, so, with, uh, I, I think I've wasted enough time. I think we can have our, our panelists come up. I'm just gonna ask you all to come up here and then uh, introduce yourself once you get up here. Let's give them, let's give them a round of applause. Stewart, I'm from Stewart Law PLC. I'm a lawyer. Uh, essentially, I help start up some new companies, get set up legally, help with your contracts. I can kind of answer questions when you're going to get sued, when you're not going to get sued. Pretty basic. Um, Paul Portman with Connect Social. Uh, I do digital marketing, so unlike just about everybody else in this panel and Todd, um, I don't develop websites or design, so sorry, I go to you guys for that. Um, I just help my clients get in front of their audience once you've built the website for them. Uh, I'm Ray Brown, I run Bitmanic. I'm basically a freelancer. Um, I do a lot of contract work, plus I have a lot of clients on the side. Um, I do design and front end stuff. And uh, yeah, that's about it. I'm Jason Sweat, I'm a freelance web developer. I do PHP, Rails, and HTML, CSS, JavaScript. All that stuff that comes along with Web development, and that's me. I'm Wayne Schaff. I have my own business called Etc. It's like Etc. Um, but uh, I've been doing web development uh, for 14 years. I'm Frederick Polk. I am a freelance front end coder guy. Um, I have a small single person studio, but I create. I also am My name is Topher. I'm a freelance web developer. I've uh, been full time for about two years, doing it on the side uh, for almost 20. I'm AJ. I spent the last six years until January as a freelancer, and now I enjoy working for the man <laughs> at, uh, at Mighty of the Midwest. <laughs> All right. Um, so the way this is going to work, um, I'm going to I'm going to start out and ask a couple <coughs> questions, uh, and then I'll open it up. Uh, to the audience um, to ask questions. Uh, try to keep them directed at the panel. Um, I know that we're, there's probably a lot of freelancers here and we can all, could all have a big long discussion amongst ourselves, but uh, we're gonna try to keep it directed at the panel. Um, and so I'm gonna start with a general question for, uh, for the panel and whoever wants to answer can go ahead and answer it. Uh, so what made you quit your job? For those of you who, were working before. I, I was actually, uh, well, there were, there's always many factors, right? Um, and for me, it was the inability to, to make a decision about my future. So, for example, I was running a department, and I couldn't choose who was in that department, and, um, and that became a problem. So, um, when I had to apologize to a couple of clients for things that happened within my department, that I had an issue with that. So, I was able to go out on my own. I still have made apologies to my clients, but it's my own dumb fault. So, for me, I, I don't want to work at a regular job for the rest of my life, and so I started a startup. And so my hope is that eventually I can sell it for billions of dollars and, and retire and never do anything ever again. <laughs> but until that point comes, I have to pay the bills somehow. So that's why I do freelancing stuff. 
I did uh, side work for many years. I started in college in the early 90s. And uh, about three years ago, it started becoming more regular and ongoing. And I was struggling to get it all done in the evenings. And I realized one day that I was wasting my, I was wasting eight hours of my day <laughs> working for a quarter of pay going to the office and leaving my family and said, if I'm going to be efficient with my job, I need to get rid of this day job thing. It's going to go. All right, cool. Sounds like you guys, it's more about the freedom for, for most people up here. Interesting. All right. Um, so uh, downside of this freedom, um, do you guys, do any of you use, uh, well, let's start with, do you work regular hours? Or uh, do you just, or uh, web development, right? Regular hours don't really, really mesh. But uh, do any of you wake up, do nine to five, and clock out at five? And I actually do, uh, except it's not exactly like that. I get up at six in the morning, and then I work for about two hours, uninterrupted by family, which is great. See, that's pretty much my only time that, that is like that. And then my son usually wakes up at around 8. I take him to daycare, get back around 9, work for the rest of the day, then pick him up at 5. And that's every single day is like that, and I don't work after 5. I am um, down the bottle. <laughs> I'm on call every hour, every day. Um, it's just the nature of care of the things that they're not able to take care of, take care of, whether they're unavailable or it's just not in their skill set to do. So. I wake up when I wake up. Yeah. <laughs> and I work out right. as late as I want. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I'm just by myself, so I have that flexibility and I take lots of vacations and work, work when I can. Nice. Um, my wife's a teacher, so she's up at 6 a.m., so I'm up at 6 a.m., and um, when I was freelancing, generally it would be two hours or so in the morning would be project management, replying to emails, kind of thing, and then I used to work with Fred for a long time at the image shop as a contractor, and when you have a client that is a primary client that is 75% of your time, but not necessarily 75% of the dollars, um, and a client, in this case, that demanded most of the time that I was in the office. Um, so I would work from nine till four at that client and then go home and put in two, three, four, five more hours of, depending on the day, of emails, other web projects. So agree with Fred with the, um, any email at any time. Um, and that, Availability of being available 24/7 to you know texts and phone calls at 3 a.m. because the website's down um, is part of the reason why I look to move out of. Does anybody use any uh, time management techniques such as like Pomodoro or uh, any of those fancy time management stuff? My favorite time management stuff. Write it down on a sticky note and hold it back. All right. I have an answer for yeah. that one, too. Yeah. I was just talking with Scott, actually, about the, the seven habits of highly effective people. If anybody has read that book, I, I really highly recommend it. The author talks about the different time quadrants. There's four time quadrants. And on one axis is urgency. Uh, so, so quadrant one is urgent and important. Quadrant two is important but not urgent. Quadrant three is not urgent. I'm sorry, I'm getting mixed up. But you get the idea of, with the four different quadrants. Um, and so at the beginning of each week, I plan my entire week. What are my quadrant two activities? Important but not urgent. 
and I, I plan out what I'm going to do on which day. And I, I try not to answer email except on Mondays. I just go through and totally clean my inbox, and that way I'm acting on my email, my email is not acting on me, and throughout the rest of the week, ever since I started that, I find that I get a lot more done because I'm not constantly being interrupted by emails. So those are the kind of techniques that I use. I use a rather low tech way, maybe. <coughs> it's a website called idonethis.com. Basically, that way, at the end of the day, it's going to be an email to everything I did. You just type in what you did, the amount of hours, you know, how much to build your client. And um, you type it in, you hit enter, and it keeps a list, and every day it sends you your list of what you've done. At the end of the week, you can see what you've done, and if you spent too much time on email, or too much time on one client that's not paying enough, it's a really effective way of going back and getting the snapshot. Does anybody have any questions about the Harvest or any any time tracking tools? I mean, the automated time tracking tools. Do you mean auto? Like it keeps track of which window is active. <laughs> oh, and does the I forget what it's called. Does it Well, I use Harvest, but does anybody has anybody done Odesk or Elance or whatever those sites are? I use FreshBooks and a couple of other integrated Mac-based apps uh, that use FreshBooks. Um, it's really difficult to manage one time tracking for invoicing. You yourself invoice out of a completely different system that your main client does. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, copying and pasting going on, but um, FreshBooks allows me the, the ability to five or six different methods or ways to track time um, and then record, them, record those hours. Um, so I've never used Harvest or Less Accounting, but FreshBooks rocks. I have tried Odesk and Elance. Um, I, I hated those sites yeah. because the people on there generally want something now and it's a small job and they want it done cheaply. And I don't want to spend my time just responding to people's urgent needs that are going to take up a lot of my time but not give me a lot of income. And I'd rather get the bigger, longer projects when I can control my own schedule because you can't really control it with those sites, at least in my experience. Anybody use now contact? That's great. Just get up off just have whatever you're working on. Push the little button, the timer starts running, stop, get a button. Cool. Yeah, that's, uh, I have, that's similar to Harvest, is the same type of thing. Uh, okay. Um, do you have something to add? Uh, I was just going to say, like, uh, my employer now uses Harvest, so when I was contracting <coughs> with them, was my first real exposure to it. But previously, I used Billings as a Mac app that has invoicing and account management stuff built into it, but it doesn't have the finances part built into it like FreshBooks or some of the other integrated um, systems. So there was definitely duplicate entry because a client uses QuickBooks and I can't export to QuickBooks. Or they use uh, Basecamp to do time tracking. You have to double enter there. And finally, I just got over the fact that I knew I had to do double entry and just did it instead of complaining about it. So. Yeah, OK. Um, I guess. Uh, well, I get a little bit of background. I, I realize I didn't introduce myself. I, I used to do uh, some freelancing. I freelanced for a couple of years, uh, just part time. I never, never made it my occupation. So, uh, but now I'm happily employed. Uh, so uh, that's why I was giving my input. Yes, if you were wondering. Um, okay. Well, I guess we can open it up to uh, to the audience now. Um, ben, shoot his hand right up. That's right. Uh, you guys know the amount of time that it takes you to build. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can't hear it. Yeah. Uh, ben asked uh, if if they bill for the amount of time it takes to bill, and Ray responded yes. Yeah. Why not? I mean, I, it only takes me like a, what an hour to do like all the billing for a whole project. So they can they can eat that. <laughs> I also do 
I go by the project as opposed to by the hour. So I just make my project fee big enough so that the time it takes me to actually do the administrative work, like billing and stuff like that, it's kind of manageable. <coughs> I don't, but as a bunch of potential clients, would you care if I did? <laughs> <laughs> I suck at building too. It took me a half hour to do what it was. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find that most of my clients value my time and value what I say to them because I don't build stuff. Um, I just I do the traditional consultant thing. So in that sense, um, yeah, I do build them for that because in essence, what I do is I value them much like what Jason does. Um, here's what the project's gonna cost. I'm not gonna go over that. And rarely do I go under that. So, it includes billing. Do you have any tips for uh, client acquisition and what are some of the most effective ways you've found to acquire clients? Email. If you are a person who invites email and you feel that you get a lot of referrals or business cards, um, do yourself a favor to start a campaign monitor or a MailChimp email list and send out uh, a very infrequent once a month email that says, I'm available for work, this is what I did. Keep it short and sweet and really grow your business via email because email is became a law of communication media. It's, people are still using their emails and they check it more frequently on a regular basis than they do Twitter or Facebook or even text messages. So I would suggest email um, and then I would follow up by simply word of mouth. If you have friends that work in the, work in the business or in the industry that you want to work in, um, see if you can assist with a project or maybe just shadow on a project and just get your feet wet and see what it's really like to be a freelancer or to be employed. Some people want to be a freelancer because they can have their all this time to do things and work on the projects how they want to. And when in reality, it's really not like that. It's really not that glamorous. I mean, you're responsible for all your taxes. You're responsible for any type of equipment that you need to replace, your food, uh, insurance, uh, kids, daycare, that all comes out of your pocket. It's not your employer who's matching what you make in, you know, in, a, in a quarter or a month or a week. I mean, that's all the stuff that you have to pay for. So for some people that say that they want to be freelancers, um, they get into it and they, after about 90 days, they're back to looking for someone else to take care of all the hidden things that they didn't know they had to take care of as a freelancer. I have some input on that too. Sorry to talk a bunch. Um, but every time I meet any freelancer, I ask them how they get clients. Because I've only been freelancing for about seven months, uh, and, and I can use more clients. And what almost everybody tells me is personal references. People they know is how they get work. And that's, that's working for me a lot, too. I've been actively doing a lot of networking, coming to meetups, meetups like this. I'm part of Toastmasters and a few other uh, things like that. And it's taken a while. Like, after six months of real-life networking, only now am I seeing a return on that investment. Another thing besides personal references is contacting your past employers. I'm on good terms with all my past empo employers, and so when I lost my job this last June, I contacted all my previous employers and told them that I'm available for freelance work, and a couple of them did give me work, including the, the, the employer that let me go. They, they've given me some work, too. It's like, hey, you're fired, built me a website. Um, <laughs> <laughs> those are a couple of good ways to get clients. I also recently discovered Reddit, uh, subreddit for hire. I put an ad up there, and within that same day, I got three or four responses. And 
that's that's about all I can think of off the top of my head. But those are things. Some uh, testers use uh, a lot of like websites like Elance and things because uh, just the reason he said people want it done now and they want it for cheap and and then uh, if uh, you're going to charge more, they say, well, I'll just go hire someone in India or China to do it uh, for a couple dollars and uh, they can work on it ten hours. And I, I think the most important part of any client contract relationship is the relationship. Okay. And so with, with those ODESC people, you barely have any relationship with them. Yeah. And with my clients, I always make it a point, even if they're remote, to go to their location and visit them face to face. Okay. Because having a personal relationship with your client builds trust. They know who you are. They can talk to you face to face and get to like you. And people enjoy doing business with people they know and they're comfortable with and they trust. And so that's a lot better of a relationship to have than somebody you've never met. Okay. I'd say I'd say a good sixty percent of my clients ever have become friends. Okay. And we go out and you know go to each other's houses for supper and stuff like that. And so you know as, as the years go by, I start getting more and more of these friends who say, Hey, you know, I need this thing done on the website. Can you do that? Yeah, no problem. I'll take care of it for you. And there's a lot less fear, there's a lot less negotiation, there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of trust there. Um, so I, I, I want to concur that uh, relationships are really, really important. Well, the, the biggest thing for me was when I decided to break out into being a freelancer, which was 2005, 2006. Um, and whatever your specialty is, get involved in that specialty. So if you want to be a web freelancer, be a part of GR Web Dev. Be a part of the mailing list. Respond to stuff where you have to go look it up before you respond to it because somebody else on the list smarter than you will make you look like a dummy. Um, experience. <laughs> totally. We, um, please don't be afraid of posting. <laughs> We don't be afraid of boobs because there are some really smart cookies in this room and not in this room that are part of the mailing list. Um, Carl Swedberg, I don't know if he's here, he'll tell you the same thing about jQuery. The, to really get your way around jQuery, be on the mailing list, read other people's stuff, and then, oh, how would I do this? For me, it was Expression Engine, is primarily what I do is Expression Engine development and HTML front end as well. But, um, you know, be involved in the forums, be involved in the mailing list, <coughs> organize a meetup. Bill Gill. Yeah. Bill it's, Gill. It's the opposite of this. It's just beer and conversation. There's no presentation. When's the next Bill Gill? <laughs> next week, Tuesday. Next week, Tuesday. At Founders at 6 o'clock. At Founders. Bill Gill, GR. Uh, GrandRapids.BillGill.org. There you go. Uh, Ray, Ray gets <laughs> clients dis despite the best efforts not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of my work is contract, so it's not really clients. It's other companies are my clients. Um, and so I just try to work really, really hard and do the best that I can. A reputation for being a craftsman, maybe. It uh, doesn't always work, but I think that's pretty important too. Besides networking, it's also being able to back up your work, being able to make something really kick ass and step by. So. Yeah, you do, you do longer term contracts. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody else, does anyone else have any input on that, on long term contracts? How do you define long term? Um, a month or six? Well, um, well, four years. You define it. I don't know. <laughs> well, there's an important distinction to make. Uh, there's a couple. There's two different kinds of freelancing in my mind. Yeah. One is where you're working through a vendor. Uh, the other is when you're directly with the client. So when I worked for AT&T, Collabora was my vendor, and I had to do everything through them. And Collabora was my employer technically. Right. AT&T was not my employer. Collabora paid me. And I submitted my time sheets to them, and it was like a one-year contract, that kind of thing. And then now, I, I don't do any of that stuff anymore. Um, that has its, its pros. You'll get paid on time, and probably a lot. And with doing direct client work, it's not necessarily so steady. It's shorter projects and stuff like that. So when you're talking about that stuff, it's maybe important to distinguish between those two categories. Yeah, yeah, versus the direct client work versus um, subcontracting, I guess. Any other input on that? I had one thing I was going to say earlier. 
um, to the previous how do you find people. <laughs> yeah. Um, where I went, ooh. Um, <laughs> well, then if talk. you're doing websites, you <laughs> have a website. <laughs> I spent, I mean, I when I started freelancing, I had a longer term vendor relationship where I would present myself as a, an employee of the company with email address and whatever, even though I was a contractor. Um, and my website had less information than my business card. And because I didn't have time to work on it, I was always doing contract work or whatever. Um, and I don't think, I think. My business card still has more than my website. Yeah, go but, to AJP.net. Well, that one's, yeah, that, yeah. I want to go the other direction on that. Um, my website has my name and my logo on it. I don't have business cards. I don't tell anyone my phone number. And I don't tell anyone my email address. And <laughs> we're all right. Yeah. That's, that's another point altogether. Yeah. Every single freelancer is going to have a completely different experience. Um, I didn't go full-time freelance until I had been doing it on the side for 15 years. And in that time, everybody, all, you know, family, friends, friends of friends knew, oh, Tolkien, he's the white guy. And so now I, I don't do any client acquisition ever. And I have more work now than I know what to do with. So the answer is spend 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I, it, it kind of is. Yeah. The more time you spend becoming known, the less time you have to spend earning projects. Yeah. Yeah. True. yeah. I had the same thing. Um, you know, being in business for quite a while, um, it, it's all word of mouth. I, I, I never go after a client. You know, I never market. Um, but you know, I, I have niche markets that have just kind of evolved over the years. Real estate. Professional coaches, uh, speakers, and uh, those are all good on the well, real estate. Used to be good on <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's changed, but but there's still enough in the network that, that uh, you know, it, I get calls you, and emails all the time. Do you solicit them to? Do you say, hey, tell your friends, or no? It's just no. just happens. No, I get some some good golden nugget clients that are real good. That's right. <laughs> All right, cool. I want to just follow up on what Jason said uh, with the question. We talk, he indicated like, there's two kinds of clients. There's the subcontract and now there's the direct con uh, contract. With people that are not used to uh, acquiring talent to do something, they don't necessarily understand the, the efforts vernacular, the, uh, the amount of detail uh, that goes into doing some of these things. What kind of uh, contractual vehicle do you use to keep everybody, uh, you know, I don't have this relationship right here. Jason, you're a new client to me. How do we, uh, you know, how do you get me to be on your page and then vice versa, so that when you know, if you're, you got this big number for me, uh, you know, I need to know that you're doing it. And when we, when you tell me Nick Lutton, that wasn't included, uh, I think you understand where I'm yeah, going. Yeah. So, so, so anybody, how do you how do you resist scope creep or uh, any of that stuff? Um, a lot of times, all I'll do is put together a letter of agreement, which kind of formalizes the deliverables and our relationship and all. It's not a real formal contract, but at least it gets us pointed in the right direction as far as um, what the project looks like or, or should look like when it's done. I actually go the complete and opposite uh, route along to your pants. Um, I actually do it with a handshake and a yes. I mean, there's nothing, there's, I mean, they want something free, uh, they'll promise you the world and just not pay you, or they will be upfront, transparent, and honest with you, and they'll say, this is what I have, and this is what I can afford, can you work with this? Then it's on you as the person who's going to work on this project to say yes or no. And if you're hungry and you want to build a, a great portfolio on the things that mean a lot, 
not to you, and you say yes. If it's all about the dollars and the dollars are right, you say no. So I, for me, it's really just, yes, I'm going to do this, and we'll work on money later, or yes, I'm going to do this, but you need to pay me a deposit, or no, I'm not going to do this. You should try her, or you should do this, or you should do that, but I very rarely now even have the, the desire. If I have to write up a contract uh, to work with someone, nine times out of 10, I am not going to even give it a second thought to work with them because that means that they've had issues and they're going to be a problematic client in the sense of they're going to want changes, they're going to probably just going to change direction several times, and that's something yeah, I don't want to have any parts of it. Watch the social network. That's my response. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is a very good reasons why people will want contracts with you, and that's because of intellectual property. And if there isn't an established agreement regarding intellectual property, you will maintain intellectual property. Rights. And if you are working for a big company, they don't want that. So they're going to want you to sign an intellectual property rights agreement. At least be willing to sign that, or they're not, if they know what they're doing, they're not going to hire you. So, for instance, if you are, and I don't do a lot of intellectual property law, but let's say you came up with part of an idea that became a patent, and they form a patent. You, as one of the people that came up with the idea for a patent, can individually sell that patent to other people. You don't need everybody else's permission. A company doesn't want that. They want you to sign an agreement saying that if you come up with any kind of invention or patent, you need to assign that to us. Now be careful on the other side of this, because I've seen this screw some of my clients, is if you sign one of these agreements and you come out with an, an idea totally separate from your transaction with this client, you might have signed an agreement that says no matter what idea you come up with, regardless of whether you're working with them or not working with them, it's their idea and they own it. That's, so that's, uh, if anybody knows who Diddy is, Sean Combs, he actually <laughs> is notorious for his clients and for, his, for signing people that if you sign with him from the day you sign with him to you die, he gets a part of anything you make, whether you're released from your contract or not. And um, actually a couple of um, R&B groups had to take him to court and nullify those contracts because they weren't working for him anymore, but he was still getting money from them. Yeah, I think those got thrown out as unconscionable eventually, but it is, um, if a company wants you to sign a contract, it might not be because they're trying to screw you, it might be because they're trying to protect their interest. But if they found it on the internet, they like they are screwing you regardless of whether they want to screw you. <laughs> so, um, it's good to have a lawyer as a friend. Uh, I would say, just to follow up the question, there's a, um, a range of value that probably changes the game as to when this yeah. becomes important. I mean, if I'm talking about two or three weeks of work where you know, there's no SEO involved and bang, 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 you know, we've got a website that's done in, in 30, 40 hours or 10 hours, you know, um, versus a you know, six month engagement. You know, we're talking about a lot of different money here in terms of uh, thousands of dollars. So where's, the, where's that change then for you guys in terms of the handshake? I imagine that would, uh, and I'm, not really speaking from experience, I don't think, but I would imagine that that would change in the client's end. Um, like if somebody just wants a, a little website and it's like a 20 hour project, uh, for me, I do that with a handshake and a yes and a 50% deposit to make sure they actually pay me. Uh, but other than that, I don't require any of my clients to sign a contract or anything like that. But if it's a big enough client to want you to, to, to have like six months of work for you, I would imagine that they're going to be the ones to probably have the contract. Right. Um, I was going to say, I got burned early on because I was naive. I didn't have a lot of experience working in a web development agency dealing with clients and left $25,000 on the table in my first two years. And when I was 24 years old, $25,000 when I have more than that in school loans is a lot of money. Um, it's a lot of money anyway. Yeah. Um, but I don't know who you are. The show change now. <laughs> show change. Yeah. 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 No. But where are you going? Right across the street. No. Um, 
And since then, every website had a contract. Um, I got to know my lawyer really well um, just from emailing back and forth. And it was a 20 hour project, would still have a contract. Now most of what would be in the contract would be terms of payment, here's what my deliverables are, here's what my project schedule is, and it's just a meeting place between uh, vendor and client that this is where we'll meet in the middle and then if I don't deliver and you don't deliver, this is what is settle, settling in court if it came to that. See, um, and that's a, like a good lawyer because you do not need a 30, 40 page contract for everything you need. You need about four key paragraphs in there, depending on your client, that nobody should be scared of. Things like, first of all, what's my maximum liability going to be? If you build a website and it causes somebody to have an epileptic seizure and they die, do you really want to have a wrongful death suit against you? No. Right? So you want to limit your liability. Where are you going to get sued? If you're working with a company in California, do you want them to be able to sue you in California so you have to fly out there and work with them? No. How are you going to get paid? When are you going to get paid? And, and how, what are your recourses if you don't get paid? That's a really simple contract. You don't need anything more complex or simple. And you can use it. You can have a form. It doesn't take you very much. It takes, an attorney should do that for you for 150, 200 bucks. And then you can use that over and over again. And it gives you some sort of protection. It helps you point to something to get paid for. And if 150 bucks for a project that is $2,000 seems like a lot, it, if you do it repeatedly, it saves your bacon so many times it's not. And you can use that one contract stress. exactly for two, three years, get it updated for another 150 bucks, 200 yep. bucks after three years, yep. and, and you're much better off. All right, all right, let's move on to. Hey, Russ. Oh, what are we going to What's up? It. Set up for a while. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm back. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, I have a couple of questions, but uh, let's pick one. Use the word web creep. Scope. Scope. Scope creep. Scope creep. Okay. Now, when I, my understanding, it to me, it's, it's the same thing as building a house. You sit down with the people. You have you lay out the plans. You know, you got your flow chart and all this stuff. And, you know, this is what we're gonna build. This is how it's gonna work. This is what it is. Okay. And inevitably, it's you build the house, and they come in and they go, "Well, couldn't you just move the wall just a few feet over that way?" Famous last words. And <laughs> yeah. And, see, and, and what the process for that is what we call a change order that says you want to change. So when you're talking about this. You know, the thing, it's like, okay, I'm going to build your website, it's going to be this, they'll do these things and whatever. It seems like people, inevitably, there's there's always, well, but the candidate doesn't do this, or they have these expectations, and they're expecting that to be just part of the package. And if you don't have a contract or stuff, how do you deal with that? I, mean, I, I call it web creep. But I mean, you know, what? Do you, how do you, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you deal with that when you said, okay, you know, I'll be able to do this, we'll do this, here it is, and you know. Yeah, that, that's more of the reason to do a contract than to risk getting, yeah, than than to risk getting sued is just this is understand a common understanding. I think that's kind of kind of what some people talked about is. Um, it's not less important to some people that, than others, uh, but Topher, you're going to say something? Yeah, um, when I bid out a project, I, I have an hourly rate, <clears throat> but I will bid a certain number of hours, and that's a pretty hard number. I'll say, this is going to take me 30 hours, and unless it goes over a lot, I'll usually eat any overage, um, just to be consistent so they can know that that's there. However, I say right up front, this is an hourly rate. If you want changes, then I'm gonna I'm gonna rebid those changes at my regular hourly rate. And it's pretty common for them to come back and go, you know what? We didn't think this through. We need to add this thing Imagine in that. here, or <laughs> we need to do something different. <laughs> and I'll say, okay, great, changes. that's fine. It's gonna be an extra four hours. And today's Friday. It's gonna it's gonna go out till Tuesday now instead of being done today or whatever. And as long as they know that up front, it works fine. 
as long as you put that in the contract that you signed. See, well, it I doesn't that either. <laughs> it doesn't even need to be in the contract. If you notice, what he did is he project managed that. A change came in, and he said, "Fine, this is how much it'll cost you." Not, yeah, I'll get it done. Right. Because there's a huge, there's yeah. a world of hurt right there. If you see something, if you're paying attention to your project well enough to say, this is going to take more time, and you just tell the client that and say how much it's going to cost, then they choose on the menu, and they choose to say, no, that's too expensive, I'm going to go back to the dollar menu or whatever. Um, that's how you can avoid 90% of the pain that comes from that. Um, I know because I work with a lot of the people in this room that things change, and I'm sorry, Ross, I've changed plans on you many times. <laughs> sorry. Um, but it's that if you let it go for three, four weeks, and then you say, oh, by the way, we're 10 grand over the project, you know, or whatever the number is, that's where the pain comes. If you just cut it right off and say, you know, we're approaching this, or that is out of scope, it'll cost this. We can do it, then we'll just take this. We risk losing the project. No. You're already in the project. Yeah. They can you're cut the project we off. This much, we agree this, this is what we want, and now you're saying it's going to cost more. That's if they want to change. change. Yeah. It's a, I mean, yeah. yeah. You have to clarify that that's different than what they asked for. So, yeah. And I need it in writing. Yeah, and for the love of God, please don't do it verbally. Just shoot an email. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's called um, something in law called the Battle of the Forms, where you can modify a contract just by sending a memo or an email back and forth. And if they don't respond or they respond positively, that can become a part of your contract. You can actually add it to your contract. So just tell for I'm sorry, but just don't leave it verbally. Um, unless, unless you're friends with 60% of your clients. Um, you can head over. Otherwise, keep it under three thousand dollars, so you can go to small claims court. You know, all of the conversations are referring to happen in email. Yeah. yeah. So when I when I'm Same. doing a bid, it's in an email. You don't Skype. So you're not in an email. So I have a really quick thought because I know we talked a lot. But as as the size of a project increases, uh, the, the unpredictability of it grows a lot um, because nobody can know everything that's going to need to go into a project at the outside of the project. Um, there's always going to be things that come up that you didn't think about. Um, and by decreasing the size of each project, you can estimate it more firmly and avoid scope creep. Because scope creep is not a problem that's unique to, to freelance. Um, I've encountered it so many times. Um, so agree to a small chunk of work and then we'll say, after that chunk, I'll do another small chunk of work. And by breaking up into small chunks, instead of doing a, a huge chunk, that helps eliminate scope creep big time. All right. Let's go with you right now. A couple of you mentioned pricing. So just wondering, how do you decide whether to use hourly pricing or like a fixed project cost? And then in either case, how, do you, how did you arrive at your either hourly rate or estimating your project cost? Well, if she's really cute, it's okay. <laughs> uh, usually heavily discounted if she's single. <laughs> Just for seriousness, I'm just family. <laughs> Otherwise, I usually, um, for new, for, for very brand new clients, I usually do um, a fixed price. Like this website will cost you X amount of dollars, 50% up front, handshake, let's get it done. If I've known you for a while, I probably would just say, uh, you know, two cheeseburgers and <laughs> a pop or something. But um, if it's for if it's for a long-term client that I had, I usually just pick it. This you know we negotiate on a rate. Um, it's usually discounted um, just because of I know it's going to be a long-term a long-term deal, and I, I personally would rather be consistently paid and make X amount of dollars um, just because like everyone up here I'm sure at some time has, not, has had a client not pay them or has explicitly said I am not going to pay you ever um, so I'd rather just you know take a little less money but be consistently paid and to build a relationship off based upon that so 
it's never really about how much but it's about the relationship itself it all comes down to hours I mean, in this in this industry what we're doing it's a service based thing so your hours are worth money your time is worth money so if you end up saying this is a project well if you if you listen to Topher's explanation, I would dare say anybody on this panel, as they say, it's going to take so many hours, which will cost you X amount of dollars. Well, that rate may change based on who the client is and whether she's cute or not, but the, the deal is you run everything back to hours. I don't like that. It's just a fact. I, you know, I've worked in the agency world for six years before I jumped ship, and really, in order to determine, are you being effective, are you making enough, or are you wasting time on this project, you have to track your hours, you have to bid against hours, then you just determine a price based on those hours, then you look at, like, for my clients who have a retainer with me, um, we're on a month-by-month -month retainer, and I give them a 20% discount over the number of hours that I'm going to spend on their project every month. I just cut 20% off of the fees, and that's what I build them. And they love it, but so do I, because I've got a nice long-term relationship with them. Um, I tell you what, the project, the, the projects that don't go, what's your hourly rate, and just say, tell me how much it'll cost to get this done, are much better than those who say, what's your hourly rate, because they want to nickel and dime you and, sit and, and watch every hour you spend versus those who say, what's a fair market value for this product that you're delivering to me, this service? Well, here's what I would determine as a fair market value. They stick with that. There's also, because we do flat rate and hourly well too, and there's a cost associated with hourly because you have to track all of your hours and it takes a lot more time, though you should track all your hours you want still to value it. But what I usually offer clients is, listen, I will estimate a flat rate for you, and I will cap it at that flat rate for you. But if I estimate it at 10 hours and I'm done in an hour, and you pay the flat rate, yay for me. If I estimate it at 10 hours and it takes me 20 hours, yay for you. Um, so I usually offer both and see which one they're willing to take. Um, I, you can't cheat with your, your flat rate estimates to try to get people to go the other way. So I usually try to estimate a little lower than what it will actually take me. Because flat rate, you can usually then all, you can ask for half up front a lot easier. You get a little more security in the deal because you're holding the cash. You have to sue you to get it back. You don't have to sue them. So. A lot of clients will want, in my experience, anyway, want the flat number. And most of my estimates are based on, I think this is going to take 50 hours. And I multiply it by one and a half for project management, scope creep, and whatever. And then that's the estimated rate. that. So there's some that I absorb and then some that um, you know, they might pay a little extra uh, if I go over, or if, if I do well, then I'm ahead of schedule and then I pocket that. Um, but then additional scope that is outside of whatever the defined project is, is then either a separate project or it's an addendum. Um, and then you know, keep track of all your time, because then you can say, I spent 30 hours this week doing whatever for this client, um, I should have estimated more on this project. Because if you don't know that stuff going forward, $25 an hour sounds great when you're starting out. Oh yeah. Until your laptop <laughs> dies and you don't have any money. You know, That's 50 money. grand a year. Yeah. <laughs> all right, 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 right. Well, I was wondering how you keep track of your account at, uh, accounting uh, over the year like for tax purposes. I've had uh, someone that I know offered to do accounting for me for freelancing at a, a period and she'd get like maybe 10% of profits if I make a profit, significant profit. Um, I, uh, I, I worked for maybe like eight different clients in the last six or seven months. And I thought doing my taxes was going to be a nightmare, and I was going to get an accountant to do it until an accountant told me not to. Um, 
and I, I just got all my W2s or W9s or whatever it is in the mail. Okay. <laughs> and I just went through TurboTax and typed them all in, and then I got my return, and it was just fine. And just real quick on the last question that was asked, I come at it a little bit differently than some of the other people who spoke. I always charge the same rate for every single client, no matter what, and I do it um, by the project as opposed to by the hour because. Yes, we are uh, providing a service, and the fact is that it's based on hours. And really, the, the number of hours you spend on something doesn't have any relationship to the actual value that's delivered. Like if somebody offers to mow my lawn, I'm not gonna ask them how long it's gonna take to mow my lawn and pay them based on that. I just wanna know how much it's gonna cost. So my clients care how much is it gonna cost, when's it gonna be done, and I just tell them those two things when we go that way. I guess I'd like to back that up. If, if you offer hourly, unless you have it in your contract. <laughs> <laughs> so to answer, so to answer your question, uh, uh, county. Yeah, yeah, county. I use FreshBooks, and um, FreshBooks makes it very easy for you to look at how much money you have made based on the invoices that you sent out, and when clients have paid, you can track your time. I would suggest maybe you look at what you've done in freelancing. And then, you know, do the math yourself and, and say, is what I've made historically worth 10% to pay an accountant? And you may have made more money or less money um, than what it would be worth to pay an accountant. I come from the thought of, I want to have someone else to blame for my screw-ups, so I would gladly pay an accountant so that accountant get in trouble with the IRS and not me because I paid him to do that or she. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, I would try to look at the numbers yourself, give FreshBooks a try, and um, just see see if it's really worth you know paying someone else to do something that you probably could do yourself just as easy. Well, the account I know is currently looking for work to do. Someone <laughs> in my family yeah. to graduate well, a little leery of uh, profit-based accounting. That seems odd. Yeah. To, and I so never work with parents. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I, I do have an accountant. Um, I pay them between fifty and one hundred fifty dollars a month, depending on what's going on. Uh, and I don't have to worry about anything financial at all. So uh, that's my my monthly account, and then I have a yearly account for my you know year of taxes. And I think I had to pay him. 300 bucks last year. Um, no one's been aged in our blood. No offense to anybody here works in But yeah, I think, it's, real I think it's worth every penny. It's not that expensive. Yeah. Um, I, I do the same thing. Um, I have a bookkeeper, $25 a month. The nice part is she, I've given her access to all my accounts. I don't have to give receipts or anything like that. She goes in, pulls the statements, done. It saves me a buttload of time that I can't bill for. $25 a month. I can make that. Is this? Yeah. I'm not telling what, you. What's her name? <laughs> and, then, um, and then I have an accountant. Um, mine's 400 But to, to run all my taxes. And I tell you what, they save me more than that every year. More than what TurboTax did before I had them. So. Do any of you guys use Expensify? This is a cool app that sticks with FreshBooks. And the IRS will allow you to take a picture of a receipt if it's under $75. And so what you do is you take a picture and you write in what it's for, what the client use was for, and then it uploads and it syncs with um, FreshBooks and QuickBooks automatically. So it makes your accounts job a lot easier from the year. You don't have to keep a cap in the middle of the target numbers. I was just going to say, like Paul, uh, one of the things that I <coughs> made it the only thing I, when I started was I had an accountant right away um, because I hardly knew how to manage my own clients, let alone I could do my own taxes with H&R Block, but to have somebody that knew small businesses, knew what, oh, you should probably file for an S Corp after you file for your LLC, or you should file for this if you're having contractors or whatever. Um, somebody who managed and paid my paychecks, you can you can find services like paychecks um, that will do your paychecks for you. Uh, I just had my accountant do it, and it would be 
25 bucks a month to have him do the paychecks and then quarterly he would file what he needed to. He had full access to my online accounts. Um, you know, works great. Yeah. All right, uh, I think we, we're gonna end here on, uh, from each panelist, their the favorite thing and their least favorite thing about freelance. Start, start down there with Um My favorite thing, um, my wife, Grew up on a farm, so she was always self-employed. Uh, was definitely flexibility of schedule. Um, if I wanted to go work up north, she's a teacher, like I said, uh, during the summer and work up there for a week as a contractor. None of my clients could really say, I, I work remotely, so I can work remotely for them. Um, and the biggest disadvantage and probably the leading reason as to why the right opportunity came along for a full-time job at the right time and why I really left was <coughs> I'm not good at managing my own business. And it took me a couple years to figure that out. It took a couple people to really call me out on it. And um, if I didn't learn a lot and learn that about myself in the process, I probably, if somebody had told me right up front, do you have the stones to go up to a client and say, for the most part, knock on their door and say, you owe me a check, pay me. Um, if you don't have the stones for that, freelancing may not be for you. And it's not that I'm trying to discourage people. It is, <laughs> there is a lot of experience to be learned. You know, Paul, Paul had the advantage of being an agency for a few years and I didn't have that. And I jumped to freelancing and was like, sweet, this is gonna be awesome. I've got a bunch of friends that are gonna send me stuff. And I didn't have the experience. Um, and it's, it can be a bumpy road to get that experience. And that's basically, that's basically my experience. I, that's where I started out and realized there's a lot I need to learn before I can start charging people that much. So, uh. um, my favorite thing's very similar, freedom. Um, middle of the afternoon, my little girl comes up to me and says, Daddy, can we go ride bikes? Sure, let's go ride bikes. Uh, this year around Christmas, my in-laws went to Texas to sell Christmas trees, so we went and house at their farm for three weeks, um, just for fun. We had a white Christmas. Um, <laughs> not to rub it in. <laughs> the freedom is really great to be able to, to go where you want, when you want, get up when you want. Um, I try to get up relatively early and get started with my day so I don't lose the day. But you know, if I want to work till midnight the night before and sleep until nine. Who cares? Um, the thing I like least has been the stress of success. When, when I get three new clients in one day calling me out of the blue saying, hey, you know, we want to hire you and you got a deadline of Friday. Yep. Um, oh man, can I do that? I don't know. Occasionally I take too much and I'm you know, stressed trying to find subcontractors and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's there's a lot of work involved, and it's all you if it blows up. Yep. Oh, and one more thing. Um, you, you have the opportunity to really screw up people's lives. Um, I have done websites for more than one very small business that was pinning their hopes on the website. And if it didn't make their business pick up again, then they're just going to fold. And that's a scary place to be somebody's putting their livelihood in your hands and saying, I don't know what you do, but here's all my money. I would have to say my favorite thing um, about freelancing is that I started something
hey, I, I'm actually a business. It's not just a business card. I, I, you know, according to Grand Rapids, I am a business. You know? <laughs> thing that I don't like is money. Um, there's, when you are freelancing, there is no set hours. There's no safety net unless you make the safety net. Unless you do all those things that, you know, millionaires and billionaires and wealthy people tell you or suggest to you that you do. You put a little money away, you spend it all, um, you try to reinvest in yourself, you try to take care of yourself the best that you can with the income that you have. Unfortunately, sometimes for freelancers, a lot of freelancers, is that every dollar that you make, you have to have, whether it's for rent, for your kids, for insurance, for equipment, for whatever, for whatever reasons motivate you to go and do the work and do the best work that you can in order to grow your business for whatever reason. There's all. There seems like there's never enough, and it surprises me that how these you know, luminaries that we have in in our industry, from the Cannonballs to you know to the Dan Rubens to whoever, um, how they're able to survive and to thrive and grow a business. When I'm sitting up here like, damn it, I didn't make my our my weekly totals. I am screwed with rent, you know. <laughs> so that aspect is I don't like because if I would have a full time job and someone else, if that was their job to make sure that money was coming in, I would probably you know feel a little more at ease. I think uh, point comfort, the, the, the flexibility of it is a big factor. Um, and also, although I'm incorporated, I, I decided that I'm not going to be an empire builder. You know, I, I, I'll do what I'd like to do, and I'll take on as much work as I want to take on. But I don't have to build, you know, a giant organization with people under me that I have to deal with. And <laughs> I'll just deal with some clients and build some relationships and grow from there. So that's kind of the, the plus side. The other side is, uh, is, is, is always the scary side of, of uh, being a freelancer, and that is I, I probably never know more than two months out where my next work is going to come from. And you have to be a personality that can handle those ups and downs. You know, you can handle you know, the, the, the pressures of you know, if you have one significant client that needs something done by Friday, but you also have to be able to handle um, downtime when you don't have it. And what I find is that void continually gets filled by the learning curve of keeping up with the industry. And I, you know, five years ago, I used to tell my clients, you know, I don't build websites the way I did five years ago. And I thought that was a dramatic statement. Now it's like, I don't build the way I did a year ago. Yeah. You know, and it's a constant learning curve. And uh, you just have to be willing to take advantage of the time when you have it to, to keep up with it or it will fall out. Okay. With any freedom comes responsibility. And with freelancing, I have kind of two kinds of freedoms and two kinds of responsibilities. One freedom that I really enjoy is I get to make my own schedule. I'm my own boss. I decide how to spend all my time. I'm kind of lucky, I guess, in the sense that I have a built-in schedule that's built around my son's daycare. I just work when he's at daycare and a little bit in the morning before that. So the, the, it's not like I really have to force myself to work. But it still does take a certain level of self-discipline eight or nine hours at home all day when nobody's making you do it. The other part that I really like is that I get to choose my own income. It's not like I have a job where I can only make this salary for the next year. Nobody's going to give you the raise you want every, they're not going to give you a $10,000 raise every year for five years in a row. You're going to have to switch jobs in order to do that. And that's what I actually did for a long time was I would just switch jobs to give myself a raise.
But you can do that with freelancing too. You decide your hourly rate. If you want more work, you could go out there and get more work. You might lose some clients by raising your rate, but when you price yourself out of one market, you price yourself into another. And some clients probably wouldn't hire me if my hourly rate was what it was uh, years ago. So those are those are the two two pros. The two cons are the same thing. You you have to discipline yourself, like I said earlier, and, and make yourself work. And during the down times when you don't have client work, you have to sharpen the saw and, and make yourself uh, more valuable by learning. The other the other downside is the, the in intermittent poverty that you experience. <laughs> If you're financially responsible, it, it doesn't hurt so much. And I, I've done a lot of uh, studying of uh, Dave Ramsey and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, that's another area where, where self-discipline helps a lot. But, but that's it for me, the freedom and the responsibility. Uh, I think my favorite thing is just the ability to keep learning something new every month or even day. Um, I do a lot of contract work. Uh, which puts me in different offices in different you know, cities sometimes. Um, just learning how these people work together, how I fit into that, what their process is. And um, it's just, it's always keeping me learning more and more and more. Um, and I think at the same time, it's also a bit of a con because when I go back to my non contract work, you know, my personal projects, I don't even know what my process is. It's like I'm constantly refining it, and it's so much work to like, keep on top of it. And, Trying to figure out, you know, what I want to do, but it's kind of a good kind because at least you're not being stagnant then, just getting comfy and uh, not learning anything. So I think it's it's a it's kind of a con, but it's it's a good con. Positive for me. I don't like the word freedom or flexibility because in reality, when I quit working for the man, I started working for 14 different men, yeah. <laughs> so or women too in there. So you know. I don't have freedom. I have, I'm, I'm a slave to my clients. But I think the determining, I can't think of the right word. Is it deterministic or whatever? I get to determine what I do today. And I can push stuff off to tomorrow. And I don't have one person telling me, no, you have to show up at this office from 8 to 5. I do get to determine to have a half day off. But do I have freedom? No, because if something goes down, I got to be there. Um, so the negative, I would say, is actually, um, I just had a really bad experience uh, two weeks ago. Uh, went up on the biggest project I've ever done in agency life or freelance. And then against an agency and lost because I wasn't an agency. And that just chat my eye. It made me really upset. So I think the negative of freelancing is people disrespect you, disrespect you because you have that in your business some way, shape, or form, even though I have a digital agency, that doesn't matter, it's not a real agency with the brick. I guess for me, the, the freedom to be able to do it how you want to do it um, is a lot. Uh, you are a slave to the man, but you have a little more freedom. You're not the slave to an incompetent boss that thinks that they know how to do things that don't. Um, the downside is you don't have an incompetent boss to blame for things. Yeah. <laughs> and the biggest lesson that I'm learning, because I I quit my incompetent boss three years ago um, with my firm, is something that uh, a friend of mine, I think he's here, Ryan Vaughn, taught me is um, every time you say yes to something, to helping a friend, to doing a free project for a nonprofit, you're saying no to something else. And that's really hard because you. When you have that freedom, you're like, yeah, I can help you out. I don't have a boss that's telling me that I have to get paid for this. But then you hit intermittent poverty because you realize, crap, uh, I just spent 30 hours this week working on free, free stuff. And I have all this billable stuff that I accidentally said no to because I said yes to all my friends or to all the nonprofits. And that's been the hardest part for me is learning that um, just because you work for yourself doesn't mean you can be a good guy. <laughs> all right. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, on that note, let's, th let's thank all of our <laughs> All right, so we're uh, probably going to head over to uh, Hopcat.
um, here very shortly. Everyone is invited. Um, grab some beers and some drinks, or maybe some crack fries. Um, if you want to, uh, well, we hope to see you all next month. Uh, see you on meetup.com um, and the mailing list and all that. Uh, see you tomorrow at Software GR. Uh, see you next week or whatever the dot, whatever the dot net thing is. Um, thanks for coming out. If you want to, uh, please put your, we'll, we'll bring out the racks for the chairs and if you could help us rack up these chairs, that'd be great. Um,